In the early spring of 1944, during the height of the United States' involvement in the Second World War, Vice President Henry Agard Wallace was busy convincing the President to send him on a diplomatic tour of the Soviet Union and China. Considered by some to be a dreamer, Wallace's initial plans for his trip were far-reaching and expansive, including stops in Moscow and the South Pacific. Out of concern for his safety, by the time Wallace left on his tour, his grand plan was reduced to a 50-day tour of Siberia and the Eastern Soviet Union and nationalist-controlled portions of China. This was not the first time that Wallace had toured a foreign country as vice president. In fact, after being elected vice president in November 1940 for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's historic third term, Wallace toured Mexico before he was even inaugurated to the position. This scrapbook, dedicated to Wallace, commemorates his visit to the Mexican National Military College on December 2, 1940. This trip to Mexico would be the first of many diplomatic trips that Wallace would make to Latin America in order to strengthen U.S. ties to the region, develop trade relations, particularly after the United States' entry into the war, and, importantly to Wallace, to understand how the U.S. might assist the peoples of these developing nations to improve prosperity and maintain peace in the region. At home in the United States, Wallace was also a busy man. Cross-country tours and speaking engagements, often with Eleanor Roosevelt, allowed him to connect with everyday people and spread enthusiasm for the New Deal and support for the war effort. Wallace's 1944 trip, which he called his mission, was both diplomatic and investigative in purpose. Always an agriculturalist and agronomist, Wallace saw his trip not just as a way to learn more about the political world of Eastern Asia. He saw his trip as an opportunity to build connections between farmers on the North American and Asian continents. In his 1946 book on his travels, called The Soviet Asia Mission, Wallace wrote, When I set out on this momentous journey to Soviet Asia and China, I did not fully realize how far the president was looking ahead. I suspect the reason he wanted me to spend so much of my time on this borderline area between China and Russia was because of my agricultural training. He knew I could see economic causes of misunderstanding, which might arise out of the handling of the soil and the livestock. While in Soviet Asia, my mission conveyed messages to the Russians, emphasizing the desire of the American people for continued collaboration, both in the war and in the peace to follow. Before reaching the Soviet Union, Wallace and a small cadre of diplomats, translators, and servicemen stopped in Fairbanks, Alaska. In this American territorial outpost, Wallace visited Alaska University, touring greenhouses and discussing the agricultural plans to deforest and plant in grain and pasture the vast wilderness of the territory. Carrying his newly acquired knowledge of far northern farming practices in the forefront of his mind, Wallace set off for his grand tour, writing, before our mission left Alaska, I told the members that the main purpose of this trip was to enhance the friendly relations between our country and the lands we were to visit. I warned each of them against making any effort to gain information of a military nature, especially in Soviet Russia, as this might cast an unfavorable light on the mission and defeat its purpose. Once landed in the newly built Siberian town of Velkal, Wallace and his entourage began a whirlwind tour of Soviet villages. They visited mining towns, schools, hospitals, industrial centers, musical and theater performances, banquets, speaking engagements at which Wallace spoke in Russian, and of course, farms. In his journal, Wallace recorded the crops and livestock he observed, writing in his diary on May 25th on a collective farm in Magadan, All hogs an excellent type of English York. They tried the Danish, but found the York could stand the climate best. Season too short for grains. Grow potatoes, rutabagas, and oats for silage. While in the Soviet Union, Wallace repeatedly recorded his favorable impressions of the Soviet military and common people. In Soviet Asia Mission, he wrote, 
I did not find the people of Soviet Asia difficult to understand, and I met persons in every walk of life, including many native Asiatics of non-Russian stock. All robust minds, not unlike our farming people in the United States. Much that is misinterpreted here as Russian distrust can be written off as the natural cautiousness of farm-bred people. An avid athlete, Wallace also found time for recreation with both American and Soviet service members during his tour. These photos of Wallace's trip to Soviet Asia show the ease with which the vice president moved among everyday people, even working alongside them in the field. Moving from Russia into Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, Wallace was treated to many more local customs and entertainments. On June 12th, he wrote in his diary about dining with a Kazakh leader. I drank three bowls of kumis with the president in his yurt. Very nicely furnished inside, made of sheepskins, draped with rugs inside. Kumis is mare's milk, which has been fermented a day. Contains about the same alcohol as beer. Very acidic. Tastes smoky. Moving to the urban center of Tashkent in Uzbekistan, Wallace was treated to continued celebrations and food, music, dance, and gifts. On June 14th, Wallace recorded visits to a pest control center and a dinner in his diary. Had a very jovial banquet with Harriman, American ambassador to Russia, Quintamilla, the Mexican ambassador to Russia, and Fu Ping Sheng, Chinese ambassador to Russia. They gave me a marvelous Uzbek robe. While in Tashkent, Wallace also enjoyed an impressive theatrical performance. He recalled the performance fondly in Soviet Asia Mission. We attended a concert of Uzbek music, lyric, romantic songs about love and war accompanied by native instruments. The ballet girls danced with much arm, finger, and head movement. Some of the entertainment was in a comic vein. It was a completely Eastern performance. Owen Lattimore attributed the strong Asian influence at Tashkent to the long tradition of urban culture centered in the ancient oasis town. The troupe of Uzbek singers presented one act of Carmen, a new venture for them. An act from an Uzbek opera followed, showing some influence of Western harmony, but thoroughly Eastern in character. The Uzbeks are attempting to blend East and West in music. The silk stage curtain was embroidered with bowls of cotton, which served to remind us that the Uzbek Republic now supplies 66% of the cotton grown in the Soviet Union. As the group moved from the Soviet Union into China, Wallace recorded his thoughts in his diary. We go over the desert, see the Great Wall with green on the south side, desert on the north, come to the deeply eroded areas near Lanchao, then we turn south. The land gets very green. On June 20th, Wallace and his entourage finally reached Chongqing in their much-anticipated meeting with Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek, whom Wallace referred to as the Generalissimo. According to John C. Culver and John Hyde's biography of Wallace, American Dreamer, the president had sent Wallace to China with five objectives. First, FDR wanted Wallace to discuss reigning in Chinese hyperinflation. Second, he was to cajole the Chinese into involvement in the war against Japan and unify militarily with Chinese communists to do so. FDR also wanted Wallace to negotiate the admittance of U.S. observers into the communist-controlled areas of the North. Crucially, FDR sent his soft-spoken and thoughtful vice president to implore Chinese nationalists to maintain peace with the Communist Soviet Union before the conclusion of the war. After much discussion, Wallace was able to succeed in only one of his five goals, the admittance of U.S. observers into the communist-controlled North. Of Chiang Kai-shek, Wallace wrote in his diary, We listened to the Generalissimo's case against the communists. It was full of bitter feeling and poor logic. I like the Generalissimo but fear his lack of vision will doom him to a Kerensky's fate. Kerensky, once a social democratic leader of the Russian people during the First World War, was overthrown during the Soviet October Revolution of 1917. 
Knowing what we know now of Chiang Kai-shek's fate during the Chinese Civil War, Wallace seems to have been more observant of underlying political dynamics than most of his political foes at home would have ever given him credit for. After his disappointing and fairly uncomfortable meeting with the Chinese leader, Wallace toured the Chinese countryside, recording his observations in his diary. 500,000 acres irrigated land. There are two temples at Quan Xian. The upper temple is run by Taoists. Like all the temples, it is located in a nice spot to have a picnic. Farmers are doing fairly well here, although the cost of clothing has gone up faster than the cost of rice. Road is crowded with rickshaws, wheelbarrows, and two-wheeled carts with auto tires. More and more hard-surfaced highways are built. Pigs are carried to market, belly up on wheelbarrows. During his trip, Wallace was given many gifts from the people and politicians he met. While in China, he was gifted this hand-woven rug depicting waterfowl next to a body of water. This rug stayed in the Wallace family and was eventually given to his granddaughter, Diane. While living in Boulder, Colorado, in 1985, Diane Wallace took the rug to H. Metal Sarkissian for cleaning. Ironically, Mr. Sarkissian had started the cooperative where the Wallace rug had been woven before immigrating to the United States. This one-of-a-kind piece with a unique story is now part of the Wallace Centers of Iowa's permanent collection. On July 5, 1944, Henry A. Wallace returned to the United States. While disappointed with the results of his political mission to China, Wallace came home enthusiastic about the future of U.S. relations with the Soviet Union. Before he could fully report back to the president about the details of his travels, Wallace had to attend the Democratic National Convention in Chicago on July 19th. Despite popular support from many of the delegates at the convention, by the end of the week, Wallace was replaced as the vice presidential nominee by Harry S. Truman. Two years after being removed from the Democratic presidential ticket, Wallace's enthusiasm for his historic and perhaps most important trip as vice president had not waned. In his book, Soviet Asia Mission, he wrote, in 1946, I am more than ever convinced that the peace and prosperity of the future depend on the United States and Soviet Russia living together harmoniously as fully participating members of the world organization. <laughs>